Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures in the world of football talk to us about their first match they ever attended. I'm your host, as ever, Richard Foster, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, Chris Wise. Chris is a commentator and reporter for the BBC on both Match of the Day, Five Live, so you'll have heard him somewhere on a match. Uh, Chris is also co-host of a podcast, Who Needs Mourinho, which covers all things Portsmouth. Great title, by the way. So naturally, we're going to start with a Pompey match, but not one that Chris actually attended. So lead us away, Chris. So if we can go all the way back to 1992, which feels like a long time ago now, um, it was a a very, very big year for for Portsmouth. And for me, as as a young Pompey fan, I was only seven years old then. And I was caught up at that stage very much in football like I was falling I was falling in love with the game and it was happening very very quickly and my dad was is a massive Portsmouth fan so Mm -hmm. really there was only going to ever be one team that I followed if he had anything to do with it and he had something to do with it yeah so so that particular year was a magical year for Portsmouth because at the time they were in what was the second division? So it would now be the championship, actually, where where they find themselves back now in the modern day. Yeah. And they'd been on this mazy cup run where they'd seen off the likes of Exeter and Leighton Orient, I think, in the earlier rounds, and then got through a replay in the fifth round against Middlesbrough and suddenly had this huge quarter final at Fratton Park where Nottingham Forest uh, with with Stuart Pearce were, were down there as a as a top flight team. Mm. And Ports have beat them 1-0. Um, Mark Crosley dropped a dropped a cross, a very routine cross about two minutes in and Alan McLaughlin was right there. He just right. joined on loan from Southampton and there was a fair bit of noise around his transfer. And there yeah. he was, popped the ball into the back of the net and suddenly Ports threw into an FA Cup semi-final and they drew Liverpool. And it was, it was a crazy, crazy time. Like I, I guess a lot of my memories of, of that occasion have been built up subsequently as the years have gone on because I've obviously I've watched the match footage and I've asked my dad a lot of questions about it but um, I still have vivid memories of certainly that first game Mm -hmm. because Portsmouth ended up taking them to a replay so that first game at Highbury the the classic ticker tape Pompey welcome, as was mm-hmm. the case for all that, you know, those that it was a real thing at the time for Pompey. And, and so when those teams came out, you couldn't see the pitch for the white, the white yeah. ticket tape. It's, it's, it was wonderful scenes. And I think it was a Sunday afternoon. So I would have been able to, to watch the game. Mm-hmm. And they took Liverpool through the 90 minutes, no goals into extra time. And then, as I'm sure m- many of you will remember that, that Darren Anderton goal, Anderton, yeah. who was just a kid at the time, and he was just making his way through the ranks. And he beat Bruce Grobelaar with a, a bobbly shot that somehow sort of yeah. went past him at the near post. And for five minutes, we all genuinely believed, even little seven-year-old me sat at home watching on the TV, <laughs> that Portsmouth were going to to Wembley to an FA yeah. Cup final. Um, and then uh, and then there was an equaliser from Liverpool. Uh, Ronnie Whelan scored after John mm-hmm. Barnes hit the post from a free kick. And the the dream felt shattered, but there was still an immense amount of pride because even though they'd come so close, they had a replay. They they still had a replay against Liverpool. Yeah, and that was one. Unfortunately, I wasn't a wasn't able to go to despite absolutely begging my dad to take me to the game. He, it wasn't yeah. going to happen. Um, right. And obviously, looking back, tickets tickets would have been so hard to come by. I think for a game like that, but it was a I think it was a Monday night or something like that. It was an evening right. game. Mm-hmm. So there was there was no chance I was going to get the opportunity to go, and it all ended in crushing disappointment when Portsmouth were were beaten on penalties. Yes, um, I don't know if you're aware. You probably weren't aware at the time, but you might have picked up the fact that that was the first penalty shootout in an FA Cup semi final. Because is it that was right? In- introduced that season, yeah. Because when I look back, you know, I was trying pick up the YouTube videos or whatever. Mm. And they definitely say this is, the trouble is it sort of cuts in and out, but I'm sure, like as usual, it's Martin Tyler. I'm sure he said, this is the first one. And and I looked at it and I'm sure that's right. I think 
they introduced shootouts into the FA Cup that year, and that would obviously be the first semi-final. Um, I wish they'd delayed it, Richard, for a year yeah, because our penalties yeah. were woeful. <laughs> I, I did, I did have to. <laughs> they didn't cut out, unfortunately, for you. That I mean, sorry, Martin Cool, the captain. I know that was that wouldn't have got into the second goal. It was so wide. Oh. It was, and then there was. The one that was sort of just dribbled down the, the middle of the goal into Grobola. And then the last one, again, missed by quite a long stretch. So yeah. let's, let's not dwell on that, Chris, because what okay. we want to do is we want to talk positive Pompey stuff. And let's go back to that, the original semi-final, the Highbury one. Because you say Anderson, he was only 20 at the time, mm. but he looked like a proper player. Now, I don't know if you ever have located the program for this game but i've got it here tremendous look at that and I, i'm going to send it to you as a thank you for your appearance today so this really? is going to yes i am well that's I, extremely kind of you thank you I, I tracked it down the great thing about this is it's got darren anderson as the cover star so they obviously right. knew what they were doing it also has a profile of darren anderson in here not only does it have a profile of darren anderson but it also has a rather nice little piece about commentary with John Motson. Okay. Wow. So okay. he's talking about the fact he's going to be commentating on this game. And I'm sure as a commentator, you will love a couple of comments made by John Motson. The first one is, well, A, I didn't realise he was the son of a Methodist minister, grew up in London and went to watch Chelsea and Millwall, which seems an odd combination. Here we go. This is what he says in his little comment. I'm always accused of favouring Liverpool, but it is totally untrue. And I've had a few commentators on this podcast and nearly every single one says, I'm always accused of favouring X or I'm always accused of... Do you, do you find that when, when you're commentating? Have you had people go, oh, of course you're a Man City fan? Yeah, I mean, you, get, you, do, you do get that. And I wouldn't say there's a specific club that I would that someone would say to me, "Oh, you you always sound like you favour them." But yeah. it's a tale as old as time, I think, for any commentator. And yeah. I think the laughable ones are when you get them from both sets of supporters <laughs> yeah, in the same game. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man United, Liverpool, blah blah blah. Exactly. Um, and also, Motson goes on to say, and again, this is something that I think will resonate with you and all with all commentators. In my early days, I was accused of using too many statistics. Now, again, having spoken to a lot of commentators, you know, they say, oh, why do you keep using all these stats? And, you know, I know all commentators now have stat packs and all the commentators say, well, you've got them there. You probably don't use 90% of them, but they're useful. Do you find that thing where you, you say, right, shall I use that stat or shall I walk away from it? How do you view that? I think, as ever, you weigh up the relevance of the stat. And I feel that now the the whole statistic side of things is maybe the dial has gone too far one way. Mm -hmm. For example... The the stat the, the one stat that I absolutely hate and I will never ever use it in in a commentary <laughs> and so you can hold me to this okay, is when I'll, they I'll say it, when they say X hasn't won on a Tuesday night since two thousand and five and you're just like that is not in any way interesting or relevant no. to this game no. at all so it's that that's the that's the one stat that i that i absolutely despise and i never <laughs> ever will use it but okay. yeah i think stats are i think stats are, there's an absolute place for stats in in football and in and in football commentary in particular because it can really help to lift a, a point or a, a moment but it, you know, all commentators will say it's about trying to find the balance between the stats and the colour and ultimately yeah. what you're, you know, describing what you're what you're seeing with your eyes rather than all your numbers that you might have. Yeah, yeah. So if we could whiz back to the 5th of April, 1992, you're right, it was a Sunday uh, and it's at Highbury. So when Darren Anderson scored, there was, a, you know, there were 111 minutes on the clock. And as mm. you say, that for those... Four minutes before Whelan knocked it in after Knight had pushed it onto the post from Barnes's free kick. You were dreaming of Wembley. Now, as a Palace fan, I have a very similar experience. 
the 2016 FA Cup final mm. when Jason Punchin scored for us. And for literally two or three minutes, I was just, I was with my son and we were, we were in heaven. This was it. We're finally, we're going to get our revenge for 1990 when they cruelly beat us in that replay. And the, the shattering goal that came three minutes later, I, I still am slightly bitter about it and slightly, I'm not bitter, but I'm just upset because when it's so close, you know, when you can almost touch for you, it was going to Wembley for us, it was winning the FA cup and then it gets taken away. And in the end it goes basically horribly wrong. It's, it's too tantalizing. Um, and, uh, you know, as as a Pompey fan, you've been through a lot in the last, you know, 40 years. So mm. that there, there is there is that moment you were watching on telly. And so did you just go, oh, no, that's it. And as you say, the replay didn't end well in the penalty shootout. Or did you suddenly go with that sort of maybe naivety of an eight year ago? It's OK, we're back. We're going to get the replay. Yeah, I think it's probably, I, I mean, I was... I was seven at the time, so it's hard yes. to kind of know what my what my thoughts would have would have been around it. But I think my even my seven year old self probably would have thought that that was that was it. That was the chance. That was our yeah. moment because we were leading against Liverpool, and hmm. and as a you know they, this Liverpool team were incredible of that you know of that particular era. Yeah, yeah. And for for Portsmouth, who just didn't get any sort of television exposure. I mean, TV and football back then was was limited anyway as a relationship. Let alone Portsmouth being prime time FA Cup semi final, and then we're yeah. and then we're leading against yeah. Liverpool. It was it was fantasy stuff, and as yeah. it turned out, it was a it was a fantasy. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. The trouble with fantasy is they don't turn into reality; they're just dreams. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, I like I like looking at the players, and there are a couple that um, stand out for me. Now, Alan Knight, as I mentioned, he was the Portsmouth keeper. The thing about I love about when I read up about Alan Knight because I I remember him very clearly because he he played. You know, hundreds and hundreds. I think it, it says here he's played 683 games, yeah. league games for a single club, which is a record. Yeah. 801 overall, all four divisions, but only one in the top tier. Now, he's got an MBE for services to football in Portsmouth. He was known as the legend. His and autobiography is. is called Legend and it was published by Legendary Publishing. So <laughs> you can't really get away from the fact that Alan Knight is a legend. So yeah. what were your memories of him? Because clearly he was there for this game and he lasted a very long time in between the sticks with Pompey. Well, do you know what? He, I'm very lucky to say that he, and there's there's a few of them actually in, in that team of the time, uh, have gone on to become friends of mine just oh, through right. the, just through the way that um that you know working with the club over the the yeah. years and and Alan is is someone who is still intrinsically involved in in everything that goes on at Portsmouth and he's an ambassador and he's there on match days so mm -hmm. he is a face that I will regularly see and somebody that I regularly speak to um right. so it's so I, I I'm so fortunate that I have these amazing memories of these players growing up mm. and um and quite a few of them now i'm i'm lucky enough to call right. to call friends so yeah. so it's great so any you know there's all so many he and he has obviously has so many old stories alan does as, as many of the mm. others do too so it's great just to you know you might have a, a flashback of a certain incident that might have happened in the early 90s and the next yeah, yeah. time you see Nightsy, you can just ask him about it and he'll, he'll <laughs> tell you. I hope he's got a memory of all 801 uh, appearances because that would yeah, be quite impressive. Might, a few of them might be a bit fuzzy, I think. but Yeah. Um, so club legend, absolutely all the way. Uh, so uh, uh, of the other players, so are any of the others you've come across, you know, since and still got... So we've got Andy Orford, John Beresford, who I remember at Newcastle. I don't remember so much at Portsmouth. Mm. Alan McLaughlin, as you say, who scored in the semi uh, quarterfinal. Sorry. Um, now Kit Simons, obviously someone I know quite well because he moved to Palace. I think he was caretaker manager or assistant manager at least three times. Um, yeah, great player as well. Um, 
and then Martin Cool and Mark Chamberlain is someone that we need to talk about. But I was interested when I looked at the program, and they've got the teams in the middle here, and Guy Whittingham is down as playing number ten, but he didn't play in the game. He was replaced by I can't think he was replaced by Mark Chamberlain because when I looked at the stats of the the game itself, so. Did, was he injured suddenly? What Do you know what happened there? I mean, obviously he was I, seven years old at the time, but do you know in retrospect why he didn't play? Because he was a I, big player for you as well. He was. And um, I'm pleased you I'm pleased you mentioned him because he's another one that falls into that, oh, that category of somebody that, that I now am fortunate enough to know well. Mm. Um, because he he was my favourite player growing up. Guy was. Right. He was a he was a striker where I I could loosely call myself a striker on the under eight okay. circuit, yeah. um, but his I mean his goal scoring record from his time with with Portsmouth was phenomenal. I mean yeah. he was the sharpest shooter that you mm-hmm. that was around on the circuit, and obviously because of that, eventually he got his move to the Premier League and he got his opportunities yeah. with Aston Villa and and with Sheffield Wednesday, and it was fully deserved and. This was a guy who was in the, the British Army only mm. a couple of years before he joined Portsmouth. Um, and so lethal was he with his finishing that he got the nickname Corporal Punishment. And obviously that one... <laughs> I didn't know that. That's good. Yeah. Like that. So, yeah. yeah. And then his, uh, and then his, what, you know, his one, his one season where he, where he scored in excess of, of 40 goals in a, in yeah. a single season. I mean, he was scoring every week and my mm-hmm. my love for him stretched to the fact that I called my first ever goldfish guy. That's oh, how I thought you were going to say your first ever child guy. No, 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 no. It didn't. It, it hasn't quite stretched that far. Um, okay. But, uh, but yeah, so, so I even, yeah, even my first pet was even named after <laughs> him. So this, right. I, I absolutely adored him. He was, he was yeah. a complete, yeah, a complete hero of mine. And that, as you say, it's lovely. The fact that, your hero then turns into someone that you deal with later at the club and, you know, have regular conversations with us. Absolutely. And if you don't mind, Richard, I just want to talk about one more player as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who is someone who I've mentioned already, which is, which is Alan McLaughlin. Um, Mm. So Alan obviously was a integral member of Portsmouth's team, not just them, but, but for many, many years and, one of one of the finest midfielders the club has, has ever had and obviously was recognised on the international circuit with the Republic of Ireland yeah. as well. And when I first went into local radio, Alan was my co-commentator. We, we basically started at the same time. He just finished playing. I just started commentating. It was on mm-hmm. Portsmouth. So we ended up travelling the country together, covered three, four seasons of football, yeah. week in, week out, every Saturday, Friday nights in hotels, car journeys, mm-hmm. you name it, we we did it. Yeah. And obviously because of that, we became immensely close. And um sadly we we lost Alan three years ago now. Um mm. and it was uh it was really tough. And the the extent of our relationship and this is i mean this this i mean it's still you can probably hear in my voice it's still yeah. i still find it quite emotional um he he asked me before he passed away to write and read his eulogy wow. at his funeral and um it's it's one of the proudest moments of my life in in one of the most grief stricken moments in my life mm. to to for him to ask me to stand up there and to deliver those words about him to write the words and to say the words um yeah i'll always hold that very very dear to my heart because he was a he was a wonderful man and the more you got to know him the more you realize what a great guy he he was um mm-hmm. and i'll i'll forever be grateful for the time that we had together and i'm still in touch with his his partner now and his his two girls as well right. um so yeah he was a yeah, tremendous, tremendous footballer. Loved watching him, and I'm sure if there's other Portsmouth fans listening, they'll say the same thing. He was, mm. he was a brilliant, brilliant midfielder, and um, yeah, as I found out, a brilliant guy as well. Right. Okay. Well, um, as I say, rest in peace. Um, yeah, taken far too young. I mean, he wouldn't have been very old when he passed away, would he? No, he'd only just moved into his fifties, so it was um, it was horrendously early. Yeah. Um. 
going back to the game, so we, we talked about Darren Anderson. So mm. not only was he the cover star, he was also, they did a profile of Darren Anderson. And this thing in that profile, they said, he's attracting attention from the likes of Liverpool and Tottenham. And right. guess what happened a couple of months <laughs> later? Off he went. And uh, he, he, Darren Anderson, I mean, established himself at Pompey. So he was, I assume he was at the academy or did he move... I mean, he, he wasn't at any other club before he was at Pompey, was he? No, no, he had he made his league debut with with Portsmouth. Um, so, and I think when he scored in that cup semi final, you'll probably tell me because you've got the player profile in front of you. But I think he was twenty. Is that right? Yeah. When he scored 20, that goal, very good. Yep, yeah, twenty. Good stat, twenty. <laughs> <laughs> the the thirteenth player, age twenty, to score in an FA Cup semi final at Highbury on a Sunday. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, the, you you do remember um these players when they break through because it's that's that's what really gets you of course you can buy you know the big transfer comes in and they prove themselves but when a player comes through from the academy or as a youth player it's a fantastic experience for the fans because the connections there and quite yeah. often they're fans aren't they so they grew up in at the club so they're obviously going to be fan and you know, you see it occasionally and it's a lovely, lovely moment. Now, the manager, Jim Smith. Yeah. Talking of nicknames, the Bald Eagle. The Bald Eagle, yeah. Now, funny enough, earlier today I was recording another pod uh, with a guy called Seb White, who you might know who's the editor at Mundial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's a Yeovil fan. Okay? Right. His first game was Yeovil losing 3-0 to QPR in the FA Cup. And Jim Smith was the manager of QPR at the time. Oh, really? Yeah. And when I read about Jim Smith, there was this thing where apparently he was very superstitious and he had a red handkerchief that he always used to have with him and he had to to check that he had it because his dad gave it to him when he was 18. And then apparently he also had a broken pen knife that he always had in his pocket. I mean, that's getting quite weird, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I, it I do left, I always have to put my left boot on first and then my right boot, but I do not carry a broken pen knife. And he said it hadn't been of any use for many years, but he'd always kept it. because. And I like superstitions, but that is quite a crazy one, isn't it? It is a bit. And I wonder if with that red handkerchief and... Um, maybe we'll have to do some digging on this. Obviously, Jim's another one that unfortunately we've lost lost quite yes. recently. But um, I wonder if that FA Cup semi final against Liverpool, he still had the red on display, or whether he just tucked ah. it slightly out of sight, because it would yeah. have been quite strange, I think, for a manager to be striding out, you know, in an FA Cup semi final <laughs> against one of the most <laughs> famous teams in all who wear red. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he ever because he said I think he's. I think I'm right in saying he said his dad gave it to him because that was when people used to wear handkerchiefs out of their pocket. But mm. I don't think it was ever on site because also Pompey's main rivals being Southampton, red is not a colour that would this go down terribly well with Portsmouth fans ever. Um, and particularly when you're playing the Reds in, in a semi-final. Um, so we've got Jim Smith, very capable manager, and, it, and he, he took... Portsmouth on on a good run in the FA Cup. But as you say, you're up against Liverpool and you look at their team, Rob Allar, Rob Jones, David Burrow, Steve Nicol, Ronnie Whelan, Mark Wright, ex-Southampton, unfortunately, Steve McManaman. Now, Steve McManaman was a 20-year-old as well. And there's a lovely, and again, you'll see this in the programme, there is a profile of the young Liverpool players because it was Souness was the manager at the time and they were saying what an injury crisis they'd had. So they'd had to bring in these fresh-faced youths. And there's a picture of Steve McManam. He, he, he looks about 12, quite frankly. But yeah, he went on to become a legend at, at Liverpool and Real Madrid and et cetera, et cetera. So when you're watching it as a seven-year-old, and you're desperate for Portsmouth to win. But you see these other players who you know are pretty good. Was that something that impressed upon you? And you go, hmm, that the, they're they're that much better or they're fantastic players? Was that something that struck you at the time? Because you knew you were the underdogs. But yeah. Did you think, oh, these players are just standing out because they're so good. 
Yeah, I think at the, probably at the time there was a few of those Liverpool players that I would have been well aware of. Obviously, this is yeah. this is way before social media and 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 all of that malarkey. So this was um, this was largely sort of catching glimpses of players when when I could because I I I'd, obviously I'd never been to see Liverpool yeah. play with my own eyes at that point because I still at that stage had had never been to a to a football game. Mm. So. So I knew of the likes of Barnes and Rush as a as a seven year old, and I knew how good they were. When I watched that game, did I think, "Oh, they're they're leagues above this Portsmouth team"? I don't think I did, really, yeah. and I don't I don't know why that would be. I don't I don't know if that would have just been a blind belief that that Portsmouth were going to get to to Wembley. I mean, I knew obviously it would have been a huge shock, but there was no part of me that recalls watching that game and thinking. Well, they're leagues, leagues, and leagues above us because it well, just didn't. Feel, it didn't feel that way that day. They were both draws. Of it. You know, you only lost a penalty shooter after the replay, so you ran them that close. And you know, if it hadn't been for that goal with five minutes to go, you you might have got. And and I think maybe the most frustrating thing for Pompey fans is that you'd have met Sunderland. I know who another second division side in the final. I know. You? You know that that could have been the moment, couldn't it? It, it feels like it, it. It really feels like that slide, a sliding doors moment. The more I watch that that game and watch that ball come, because because that that free kick from Barnes, the equaliser for Liverpool, mm. I think, and it's obviously it's difficult to see because you've only really got two replays of it from yeah. slightly different angles. But it looks like Alan Knight might might just get a flick of the fingertip to I it. I think he claimed he did. He claimed yeah. he did. So yeah, yeah. It would have... so he pushes it onto the post, but. You talk about the barest of margins. That ball yeah. could have gone anywhere, and it's just yeah. run back across the goal line, basically. And the only one who's following it in was 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 Whelan. Ronnie Whelan, yeah. And how things could have been so different had you know they might have got to the final ports and then, and then been yeah. beaten by Sunderland, and we Oops. aren't talking about it as romantically <laughs> as we are now, you know. But yeah. it just, yeah, it really, it really felt like they were on the unfortunate end of a of a of the wrong bounce there, Pompey. Yeah, sliding doors moment. Do you think if it, it? Sorry to do this to you, but do you think if <laughs> Pompey had actually got to the FA Cup, do you think your dad would have taken you? I hope so. I really hope so because yeah. because that um, that second that second semi final. I don't I don't ever recall asking to go to that first semi final. I don't. That just wasn't something. Yeah. I don't know if it just wasn't on the agenda, but I must have been so taken by everything that I'd seen in that first game. At, at Highbury when I watched it on the TV that mm. I was desperate to go and I still vividly remember waking up that morning and going into his bedroom on the morning of the cup semi-final replay mm. and he's in bed and I'm saying to him please please take me tonight <laughs> and I would, obviously I would have been going to school that day and everything yeah um, and he was he just said it wasn't possible and obviously i didn't get to watch the the game was late i'd have been in i'd have been in bed yeah. but i do i also remember the next morning the first thing i did was was wake up go in there i think he'd probably got back at four o'clock in the morning or something yeah, like that so yeah, i probably yeah. woke him after two and a half hours sleep just to know what the outcome was so yeah it was um it was crushing it was crushing well, at least he saved you from some of the worst penalties ever taken. He, he did. He could, have, he, could have, he could have done with ensuring I never saw the footage as well. <laughs> well, yeah, but you you know, that censorship, you can't you can't have that. Yeah, it's true. Um, it's true. But let's move. So that was, you know, a week later, maybe. But then let's go to the game, your first game you actually attended, which mm. wasn't quite as glamorous as Liverpool in an FA Cup semi-final. No, it wasn't. It was a it was a second division game. I'd been waiting patiently to to see to see Portsmouth, um, and this so this is an opportunity to to go to Fratton Park, and it was probably about two thirds of the way through the season. I yeah, think it was March, yeah, yeah, and uh, and it was a home game against Watford, and mm-hmm. I I mean I don't really I mean I remember a lot of things around the game yeah but in terms of the match itself I don't really have much recollection of it and I'm sure I won't be the first person to say that it's on the podcast or indeed the last I don't think there have been that many people the only people weirdly I think one of the people who remembers the game the clearest is ex-palace manager Alan Smith 
who went to watch Fulham play Newcastle in an FA Cup tie in 1956, I think I'm right in saying. Wow. Fulham four, Newcastle five. Yeah. And he can remember, that's maybe why he's a manager and we're not. He can remember details of that game. And you're thinking, God almighty, that is, you know, almost 70 years ago. And you've got that memory. And because yeah. he wouldn't be able to check it out on YouTube. I think there's Pathé News, but there is nothing like the coverage you would get even in the 60s or 70s. It was in the mid 50s. And he, he can remember those things. But yeah, it's more to do with the sight, the sound, the smells, the, who you went with, how did it feel? I think one of the key things is the ground, because mm. that's the thing I think that strikes most of the people on this podcast. They remember the ground so clearly. And Fratton Park, for me, is still one of the great ground. I love Fratton Park. I went yeah. there a few times as a Palace fan, and it just has that good old-fashioned feel to it, which... It does, yeah. It's not a swish uh, stadium. It's not particularly um, up to date, but it's great. So what do you remember about Fratton Park uh, on your first? It was actually on a Tuesday night. So it was a it was a floodlit game. So I was very, I was probably very fortunate then that I got to, yeah, got to go. Exactly. This School week. next day. Exactly. Exactly. And that's probably that was probably months and months of begging that finally got me permission to go to that game. Um, I. I remember coming coming home from school and and I knew that I was going to the game, mm. so we'd have we'd have travelled down there. Now, what I don't what I don't recall, and I'll need to check with my dad about this because it, yeah. because later later down the line for lots of the away games we used to as as so many supporters do, but I I loved it. It felt like a routine to me. We used to put the scarves out yes, of the out window. Of the window. Yep. Um, and my and my, for my dad, we had they were sort of the classic old blue and white scarves. There was no there was no badge on them or anything like mm. that. He'd had them since he was about ten years old. And um, one one particular car journey, I lost a, a scarf. I opened the window too oh, much, dear. and the scarf disappeared down the motorway. And yeah, I think he 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 had to bite his tongue a little mm. bit because this was a scarf that he'd had for for yeah. forty years. You know, I can I can see where he's coming from. Yeah, yeah. I can too now for sure. Um, <laughs> so I don't I don't think we'd have had the scarves out the out the window on that particular day because obviously we were going to a going to a home game. But mm. I, I don't the 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 drive was probably about half an hour. The the walk to the stadium was overwhelming. I think a lot of I felt like a lot of those early games that I went to. Though I had that that buzz, that excitement, I yeah. was just sur- surrounded by by primarily men, mm. and a lot of them had obviously had one or two beers to, to yeah. put it politely, and there was no. It wasn't. It wasn't a fa- I wouldn't say it was a a family friendly atmosphere no. going to going to Portsmouth games and that's not because the club weren't trying to do that because of course they were but yeah. it was still we were still obviously of an era and we were you know this was the early 90s and we were still moving yeah. out of some of the the dark and difficult days and there was elements of that mm. that that still existed and Portsmouth Portsmouth's a working class city yeah. and it's um you know and one of its great charms and the same with Fratton Park is it's rough and ready mm, and agree. And now, for me as a as an adult, I like you. I love that element of it, and and I have done for a long, long time now. But then, when I was little, it was slightly frightening mm. and a little overwhelming. Yeah. And we had to walk up some dark, not very well lit alleys yeah. with lots mm-hmm. of lots of strangers, and sometimes bumping into away fans yeah. and seeing things that you probably don't want to see as a seven yeah. or eight year old. True. Um, but yeah, I, there's, there's, it's, it's so strange because there's certain songs even now that come on the radio and it just mm-hmm. immediately ports me right back to being in that, in that ground in those early days at half time. Right. And, okay. You know, over the PA system, they play yeah, music yeah. and there's certain songs. There's one, there's one, <laughs> it's so random, but there's one song by Shaka Khan. Oh, really? That yeah, that that every time I hear it, it's it just takes me to it just takes me to that stadium at half time and sort of being stood there with with my dad and maybe I'd have one of those little plastic um, boxes that you'd put on the ground so I was yeah. you know so I could see essentially, um, 
and that that whiff of hamburgers and yeah. stale alcohol and probably stale something else in the air yes um they are they are some of my greatest memories of growing yeah. up being inside that stadium and watching football because it was just it felt like a it, it almost felt like a rite of passage mm. to be yeah, there absolutely. to being a football fan i felt like I felt like a, I wasn't obviously because I was seven or eight, but I felt mm. like a man because I've been yeah. allowed to finally get a chance to go yeah. to a football game. And there I was stood with my dad and with all the other men. And obviously mm. there were, there were women there clearly, but, but, but just saying yeah. I, you know, as a, as a boy, I felt like I was suddenly a man. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was, it was a, it was a sensational feeling actually. And it still, yeah. it still gives me that, that buzz now thinking of, thinking about it and mm. calling those memories. Yeah, no, you're, you're right about those. Uh, you're, I think you were actually the first person to talk about the halftime music. And I think it's a very good point. Was it the Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan, that one? Or... It was the, it was I'm Every Woman. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. You I know the one? one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not going to sing it because I don't want to put people off. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it for you either. Immediately switch off the podcast, that'll be it. <laughs> but Fratton Park, again, I, I didn't realise until I started researching um, for this particular episode, that it was called The Old Girl. Did, did, did you ever call it The Old Girl? I didn't call it The Old Girl, but there's a few stadiums, isn't there, that are colloquially referred to as as The Old Girl. You know when they, yeah. you know, the stadium's going and they say, oh, The Old Girl is rocking yeah. now. It's always a female, isn't it? It's always feminine. It's always a female, yeah. Yeah, maybe something, I don't know. But it was opened in 1899, so... It's got 125 years and it's still, you know, it's probably the oldest existing ground, isn't it? That's always been Pompey's ground. I feel uh, like some of those pillars that you can't, sometimes can't see the action from from behind uh, were there in 1899 as well. Possibly. Um, but the fact you're, it is a, was a floodlit game, I don't know, this is my nugget, because, you know, I'm a bit of a keen, keen on nuggets. Yeah. Pompey was the first ground to host a league match under floodlights. And I can tell you, I think, Richard, who that was against. I'm, Unless I'm you're ready. I'm me. ready. No, 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 no. Well, oh, I'm no, nervous no, now. I've put, my, I've put myself on the spot. I think that was against Newcastle United. Is that right? Ten no. points, Ooh, Chris. Good. Ten points. Well good. done. I need the date. No, no, no. no. 22nd I'm going to say 54? Two years out. 56. Okay. But uh, you're gonna, you've got your ten points. So I'm not going to take it away for a couple Thank of you. years out. You're allowed a couple of years margin. but. <laughs> What a fabulous uh, thing to have, the first yeah. ever league floodlight game. Um, and those and those I don't know if you know, but those those floodlights and there was a there was a great deal of disappointment about it from Ports of the Fans quite recently, only two or two years ago, something like that. They took they took the floodlights down. Yes, I heard, yeah. Um I mean they weren't they weren't functioning the way that they needed to be anymore. But there were I think there was a lot of Ports of fans and they took they took a couple down and there was one or two that were still left up for a while, but now they've all gone. Mm. But um I think there was a lot of Portsmouth fans who felt that that they didn't they didn't want them to be taken down, even though they weren't being they weren't being used and they were redundant yeah. as floodlights. But they w- were and certainly are in my mind an iconic element of that stadium. Yeah. And when you used to drive into the city, because obviously it's a city that's on an island, so you yes. keep, there's two roads that you come in. You either come down the M two seven five or you come down Eastern Road. But when when you were coming into the city. That was the landmark that you could see on the mm. in the skyline was the was yeah, the yeah. floodlights Fratton Park and that is sorely missed I think now by a lot of Portsmouth fans. Mm. Yeah, you. I suppose as you say, if they've been there since a, a long time, I mean, you do have to move on. But maybe they could put them. Have you got a Have you got a Portsmouth museum somewhere? You could chuck them in there. <laughs> they might have yeah, been but... deconstructed by now, unfortunately. So. Uh, I, I, who knows? We'll need to let the Portsmouth historians uh, fight that one out. Uh, so when you went for this game with your dad in the evening of March 1993, do you remember where, where you sat or did you stand? Because obviously the, you've got the north and south and then you've got the Milton and Fratton ends, haven't you? Yeah. So I remember going as a Palace fan, you were sort of in the corner. Was that the Milton end? That the, the where the away fans yeah. used to go. And so the away fans, edge. the away fans are down. If you if you if you're an away fan and you're stood at Fratton Park, the the dugouts are 
uh, you're behind the goal and the dugouts yeah. are off to your left hand side. That's so right. that is yeah. that's the Milton end, and that, so you're right. facing the you're facing the Fratton end, which is the yes. the sort of main yes. hub, I guess, of the 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 noise at, at the stadium. And there's a lot of noise at that stadium. Yes, it is. A, I do remember an atmosphere certainly yeah. for, for Pum- Portsmouth games. And talking of atmospheres, and I can't I can't really avoid talking about this. Mm. Is that the Pompey chimes, which uh, rings out memorably nearly every game, I thought, and still still does. It's the man with the bell that slightly worried me. That um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure, maybe I'm making this up, but I'm sure I can remember it being rung whilst we were there with for Palace games. Um, so a chap called John Westwood, who changed his name in mm-hmm. 1989 to John Portsmouth, as you do. Um, and he's now in his 60s, I believe. But he's got tattoos. Someone said he has 60 tattoos, which are nearly all Portsmouth. Have, have, you must have met him. So oh, yeah, said- I've met him. Yeah, I've met him multiple, multiple times. And even if even if you haven't met him, you're going you're going to see him. On a match yeah. day, because he is, as you will remember from those years in the Premier League with Portsmouth, he is yeah. unmissable. He is, yeah. His he look does. is unmissable. He could never be inconspicuous. He definitely and could. I don't think he wants to be, to be fair. <laughs> no, you don't, he... you don't wear a big blue and white wig and have no. lots of tattoos all over your body, a waistcoat, which is blue and white with nothing underneath and have a giant bell in your hand and yeah. not want to be noticed, right? Yeah. No, he's not a shy retiring guy, is he? Let's face it. I wonder how he's allowed to take a bell into a football ground. Because as you say, those days you would, you know, I mean, now security is probably even tighter, but in those days they used to frisk you. So Mm. he must have had permission because it was a bell. I mean, that could be used for other purposes apart from ringing out the Pompey chimes. So did he get specific permission to walk into a football ground with a bell? Yeah, I don't know is the question. I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether that, yeah. happened for him or not i think um he's i know that i know there have been occasions in the past where uh he's struggled to gain entrance to certain yes matches. I, I, I read about that yeah um mm-hmm. that may or may not be bell related um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i'm not sure i'm presu- i'm presuming that he probably it probably does because you because have you have you ever seen the bell? It's heavy duty. It's uh, well, yeah, it's no. I, well, bell. I've heard. I haven't been that close to it, but it must be heavy duty because you can hear it yeah. throughout the ground, which is quite an impressive thing. If it's a noisy atmosphere, still cutting clear of uh, all the the background noise. Yeah, but he he was really the face, wasn't he? Of if you're talking about supporters back in mm. back in Portsmouth, several years stay in the Premier League. He was from a fan's perspective, he was the face of the club. Yeah. Um some ports of fans like that, others I know don't. But mm-hmm. he was, he you, that's undeniable. He 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 was you know, that it was the very first thing the TV cameras looked for when they turned up at Fratton Park was and yeah. they knew exactly where to look, right in the middle of the Fratton end. <laughs> guy with a big blue and white wig. Yeah. I think we've got him guys. Oh, there he is. I don't think there are anyone else like this. But as you say, I can I can understand maybe some Pompey fans don't like it because it's all about one guy and it's not it should be all about everyone it's like at palace you know the homestale fanatics who came in when the club were in trouble and sort of built out of that and lots of commentators talk about the atmosphere at Selhurst Park and to be fair to them they did when we were in a bit of trouble they managed to support the club and be vociferous and now we're you know 12th successive Premier League season the, yeah a lot of people go, oh, do we have to go on about the home self fanatics? Because, you know, being there, done that. There are other people, other parts of the ground. But anyway, we're, we're not here to chip away <laughs> at those sort of things. So looking at this season, so 92-93. Yeah. Can you remember what happened to Portsmouth? This may again be a slightly more painful memory for you. Yeah. So this is the this is the season, isn't it? Just before the start of the the Premier League. This is right, isn't it? And we are we talking? No, your Premier League's actually begun now. Because so this is, 
March ninety three. So so Premier this League is ninety two. This is the first okay. year of the Premier. League. So that's right. So this this is the season. I think I'm right in saying where they end up missing out on going up on mm-hmm. goal difference. Correct. Is that right? Yep. yep. To to whom? to to Newcastle. And mm, Newcastle won the league, but yeah, there was a and, team and that was West on the Ham. same point. Well, yeah, Is that very right? good. Another yeah. 10 points. Um, yeah, yeah, they were third on goal difference behind West Ham. They had plus 40, you had plus 34, 88 points. I mean, that's a lot of points yeah. to not go up. And Newcastle were ahead at, on 96. The one thing that struck me when I looked at Portsmouth's record in this season, you only conceded nine goals at home. In 23 games. It's phenomenal, I mean, isn't it? That's So that's why a 1-0 was probably quite a familiar score. <laughs> yeah. And and as you say, that season, Whittingham, 43 goals in 42 league games. But you only scored 80 goals in total. Yeah. So he scored more than 50% of your goals. Which yeah. It, that is, it's sort of unbelievable. And it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a record at least in the in the in the model, uh, modern era. It's a record that that stood until only very recently when when Alexander Mitrovic, yes, for Fulham, for Fulham, yeah, 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 bashed in all those goals. Um, but, but otherwise, for for a long time, Guy Whittingham's records stood out. I know, and you you may know the answer to this. There was a, and I was I was rightly pulled up on this when when it was going on with Mitrovic, and I was talking about guys guy's record and somebody made the point to me that there was a there was a striker with Middlesbrough many we're talking many years ago now right. um who'd also um had 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 a had had one unbelievable season um right. so I think and I think and I think rightly it irked it irked the family at the time because there was a lot of talk about it Mitrovic beating guy's record but actually there was, okay. a, there was this, yeah. There's a there's a middle there was a middle striker. I must I must hook his name out actually. Um, now, how long ago were we talking? Did we're talking a long record? time. We're talking a long time okay. ago. We're talking probably fifties maybe. Okay. Um, not but, not yeah, my strong but, point. The fifties, I'm afraid. I, I mean, I know I'm old enough, my, but I'm, the mine 50s neither. Is... <laughs> unfortunately, you need you need Alan Smith for that. Judging by his memory of that Fulham Newcastle game, exactly. I'm sure he'll he'll he's got it down to a T. <laughs> um, Again, I'm sorry about to inflict so much pain on you, Chris, but you do support Portsmouth, so that's the way it goes. So by being third on goal difference, you then went into the playoffs. And Mm. as someone who's written a book about the playoffs, we're going to have to look at the playoffs and Portsmouth. So you lost to Leicester in the semifinals. Do you know that... God, I hate to do this. Portsmouth are one of the only... (laughs) Two clubs to have been in the playoffs more than twice and to have never won a tie. Yeah, it's a, it's a, sorry. it's a disgraceful really record, and it's one been that in comes it four up. times. Honestly, you? every time oh. they get into a play, into a playoff, the, the the same the same statistic always comes up, and somehow Portsmouth have always seemed to find a way to continue the trend. Yes, it's it's. It's quite impressive to do it because it was Plymouth in 2016 out of League Two, Sunderland in 2019 League One, and then Oxford most recently in 2020. Yeah. And those two Oxford, those two Oxford games were two of the worst football matches I've ever put myself through. Yeah, I mean they Oxford, Oxford were bad, and Portsmouth were really bad, and bad prevailed that day. Well, I mean it's yeah. You can you, again tantalizingly close. You could have got to Wembley. You could have got promoted four times. Right, my la- This is my last quiz question. By the way, I'm not going to keep doing this. But okay, do you know the other club that has failed in the playoffs semi-finals? Ooh. more t- more times. They've failed six times now. Never won a tie. Never won a playoff game. No. Nope. Well, they've won a game, but they haven't won a tie. So they've never got through to a final, having okay. been in it six times. Okay, I'll have a I mean I'm I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have an absolute guess. It's a I've tough no, question. It's, it's tough. I've got no I've got no idea. So I'm gonna have a guess at Norwich. No, good idea. They have won uh, they beat uh, I mean they won two nil. I was there. Uh so it's a club that not many people like. 
it's quite a few that fall into that category. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, but generally there's an issue with their formation, as in when they were founded, because it came out of an old club and they moved the club. From oh, I see. Place. Okay. So they're not just not liked by local people. They're not liked by a lot of teams. And uh, they might, Generally. in the words, the word franchise might be rattling around with them a fair bit at the moment. Yeah. You've got it. So MK Dons have lost six times in the playoff semifinals and they've never won one, which is, I mean, some people would say that's schadenfreude. You know, mm. if you, you, you do franchise football, that's what you get. But uh, there we go. But... I don't want to dwell on the misery of the playoffs. What I want to do is actually move to a slightly more positive time for Portsmouth. So in 2003, you got promoted to the Premier League. So can you remember your first Portsmouth game in the Premier League following that promotion? Yeah, so it would have been it would have been the opening game of their season I guess yeah. of the Premier League which and they were at home on the opening weekend I think they played Aston Villa mm-hmm. I think that, you're right I will right? check it hang on I've got my book yeah here, so I'm gonna check. go on Premier you, League have a, you have a you have a I'll, check I'll dive in here Portsmouth here we go first game yes indeed Aston Villa correct Fratton Park 20,000 there yeah, Chris Wise amongst them. He was. Um, now you've got to try and remember the score, Chris. You you'll remember the score. I should I should do. I think, as I say, it's a happier moment. So there's a hint. Yeah, but I'm I'm trying I'm trying to remember if they if they won the game or if they drew that game, which is slightly slightly embarrassing on my behalf. Mm, well, go go above. Yeah, so okay. you, you won it. So they, so I'm gonna say yeah. So I'm gonna say t- two one. Yes, very good, very good. Now, scorers, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna test you on that. You could probably guess. Yeah, well, there was a there was a few. Um, I mean, obviously the the goals of Svetislav Todorov had taken Portsmouth up, but then he very cruelly got injured just before that first right. game and was never the same player for for Portsmouth again. Um, okay. I guess there's a chance Yakuba might have scored. Because he 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 played a big part in yeah. in that team. He did, but he didn't score on that um, day. But you know, I think you did did Pat did. Uh, I'm trying to think who who was there. So Patrick Berger would have come in around then. Yeah, he Got scored. He might have scored. scored yeah, um, and then a man, Steve who, Stone, maybe. No, the man who holds the record as the oldest goal scorer in the Premier League, which will be Teddy. Yep. Young Teddy, old Teddy. So, yeah, yeah. Patrick. But, um, and Harry Redknapp clearly was your manager. So yeah. that that was, that must have been a great moment because, you know, the Premier League had then been around for quite a long time and Portsmouth had been a big club in, you know, way before your time, but, you know, in the 40s, et cetera, et cetera, and, and won the FA Cup and, and being, I think you must have won the title a few times, didn't you, the first yeah. division title? Um, so this is this is a great moment for Portsmouth because you're now back on the big stage. And let's face it, you lasted quite a few seasons until things went slightly wrong. But we, we're not going to go into administration. That's not <laughs> what we're here for. But, but I can tell you that a few, I think a few days after that Villa game, they had, um, so they must have, they, they, this must be, Three, maybe three games into the season, something like that. Their next home game was against Bolton and it was mm-hmm. a midweek game. And they thrashed Bolton that night and Sheringham scored okay. in that game as well. Right. And they this was on the Tuesday and I think the bulk of the Premier League fixtures were on the Wednesday and the Portsmouth fans took great delight because for 24 hours, they were top of the Premier wow. League table in those <laughs> early weeks of August. Oh, brilliant. It didn't last long, but still... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we've all been there. Palace were once top of the first division for a week in 1979, and we've never been anywhere since. So, you know, we've all had a little grasp of glory and then <laughs> slightly faded away. But, you know, that that's the way things go. So, yeah, that, that was then a great period for Portsmouth, not only because you're in the Premier League, but having... Just failed to reach the FA Cup final. What did Portsmouth go and do in this period? You must remember 
2008 pretty well. I do. And they, I mean, they obviously, that, that, that cup, that cup run was, was tremendous. Um, mm. With with the highlight being, as you'll probably remember, the the, the game at, at Manchester United in in the quarterfinals, where we we all thought they were they were doomed really when we saw the draw because they'd had a relatively fortunate run to get to that point. I think they they knocked out Ipswich with a very late and and lucky goal, and then mm-hmm. and then Plymouth, I think it was in round four, and then I rem- remember them hustling their way through a game at Deepdale against Preston that they didn't really deserve to win and they did right. and then so then suddenly they're in this FA Cup quarter final and and they drew Manchester United away and we thought that's that's them that's done right. and yeah. this was actually at a time when I was commentating on the football club as well for the local radio station so oh okay so so yeah so we went up to Old Trafford it was an early it was an early game and I can honestly say there are very few games that would match that game in terms of how a team has conspired to to lose in the way yeah. that Manchester United did that day because they yeah. had so many chances. And you talk about goals living a charmed life. Portsmouth, I, I honestly, even now, I still watch the highlights back and expect Manchester United to score. <laughs> there, was, there was a chance, one particular chance for Michael Carrick that it just baffles me that it didn't end up going in the back of the net. And then... A breakaway of of which they'd had very few in the whole game, and yeah. um, and Thomas Kushak, I think, was the Manchester United goalkeeper, mm-hmm. and he he cleaned out Milan Baros and was sent off, and Rio Ferdinand had to go in goal because United didn't. I don't know if they didn't have a keeper on their bench or they'd used up all their subs. I can't remember which of the two it was, but anyway, Ferdinand had to go in goal, and Sully right. Mantari, you'll remember him, scored the yes. Scored yeah, the penalty, yeah, yeah. and that was it. They got to an FA Cup semi final, and it was a year when they they got to the final, uh, semi final, and the other three teams that were in the semi final were all in the championship. That's, that, you so you can't believe that. Can how you? is your it luck? Would never happen now, would it? No, it would never. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. So um, yeah, so I think Bar- Barnsley were one of them because they yeah. knocked out Chelsea in the quarterfinals as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, it was a. The the gods were 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 looking down favourably on Portsmouth on that particular year because well, yeah. well you're cashing in your chips from you know the Liverpool semi final a few <laughs> years before uh, and as you say you went all the way and you met Cardiff another second division side mm-hmm. um, and that was the first FA Cup final without any of the old big four since 1991 which really is pretty, yeah so. When we talk about the big four, Man United, we're not talking City, we're talking yeah. Man United, Arsenal, um, Liverpool and Chelsea. Um, and it was and a- Richard, I think I'm right in saying that that FA yeah. Cup final as well was a record attendance and still is for right. a game okay. at Wembley. Yeah, well, in, that could in, be right. In, terms of in a, the new the, Wembley. Yeah, in yeah. the new Wembley. Yeah, I, I did read that, and I, I must admit I didn't follow that up because there's quite a lot of research to be done there. But maybe that's true. Um, I tell you what else was amazing about your FA Cup final um, run: you won every tie by a single goal. Mm. Do you know what? That's only happened three other times since World War Two. Really? Yeah, a Man United have done it twice. In 1990, when they robbed Palace in the final, <laughs> we're not going to go on about that. And they did it also in 1977. The other team to have never won a an FA Cup tie by more than one goal, Blackpool, 1953, nice. the Matthews final. So right. that's quite good company, isn't it? So you got it is Blackpool Matthews final. You got Man United who dominated football for a long time, and then good old Portsmouth who yeah. didn't win anything by more than one goal. Um, so, well done, Pompey. So we're now into the positive period. And yeah. you suddenly go, did you go to any of the UEFA Cup games? I did. I commentated on all of them, actually, for again, for local radio. So this was the right. thing. I la- I landed on my feet because I'd that that season that they, they won the FA Cup was my first full season as a, as a commentator. Right. So this was working for a local radio station who were called The Key, who unfortunately don't exist anymore, as many of them don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and we we were able, because we had the rights, 
to 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 go to all of these European games. So I did I did them all. So it was So you actually went to the game rather than off, yeah. the, off the tube. Right, yeah, we okay. went to all of them. Yeah. Wow. So, so uh, what was the most amazing one? Or what was the first one you went to? So what was the, the first European game for s- Portsmouth away? Yeah, so they had a so before they got into so it was the UEFA Cup yeah, as it was, was then. then. Yeah. Yeah. And they had a they had a qualifying game to to get there basically against a Portuguese team called Vitoria Guimarães. Mm-hmm. So that was the first one that we we did, and they they bundled their way through in a, in in extra time. I, I think having yeah. um, having almost made a a real pig's ear of it, they got themselves through. Mm-hmm. So so then they were put as it as the competition was then they were put into a group of of. Five, I think that's right. So okay. there were five teams in the group. So it was Portsmouth, AC Milan, and we'll come on to that in a minute. Yes, we do um, remember that. Wolfsburg of Germany, uh, oh, yeah. Bra- Braga, yeah, and Portuguese. Yes, and the Eredivisie team uh, here in vain. So mm-hmm. that was the that was that was Portsmouth's group, and you played everybody once. And so you had two of them came to you and yeah. two of them were out there. So, so yeah, so Pompey's away games were actually in, in Braga with that. And that's the stadium that's got the great the amazing cliff. Base. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. It. yeah behind I've never been there, but I've seen, seen pictures and, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's what everyone talks about Braga and the cliff. It's a bit like when I was talking to Seb White about Yeovil, everyone talks about the sloping pitch. Yes. They don't talk about Yeovil. They just talk about the sloping <laughs> pitch, but anyway. Yeah. So the game, so yeah, so the away games were there and then we have one in the industrial city uh, of, of Wolfsburg. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. that must have been fun. Um, so when you're commentating, so you're commentating for the local radio. So you know what John Motson was saying about partiality, uh, mm. you know, and, and what we spoke about briefly for commentators. Obviously, if you're commentating for a local radio station, you can be partial. So how, as a fan, how did you keep vaguely objective or did you just let it go? I think there's an element of you that will always try and stay relatively objective because yeah. you you have to be. But then equally, it, by the same measure, you know that your audience is almost exclusively Portsmouth fans. Mm-hmm. So they don't want you to be going big if, you know, when yeah. Aston Villa score at Fratton Park against Poppy, <laughs> they, don't, they, don't want you to, they yeah. don't want you to be screaming what that. What a cracking goal exactly, that is. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you're fortunate, I guess, in that you, you, can, you can play up to that, that role Mm. a little bit um and actually i find myself now when i'm when i'm doing ports of the games which is obviously very Im- infrequently um but yeah. i'm actually there at the weekend they're playing west brom on on sunday and i'm, I'm oh, going, right. okay. going to do the game to do some updates from there but you you end you almost end up finding yourself going the other way mm. so you so you make sure bending over backwards exactly to be exactly yeah, because yeah, yeah. you don't you don't for a moment want to to come across as having any um any skin in the game as they'd say now yes yeah 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 i do hate that expression but i i mean it's it's a it's i, I a, put it in the inverted commas i, yeah, I knew yeah. you did that for a reason <laughs> um, <laughs> um brilliant so all that comes together and you know you, you have your first game because you watch it on telly then you have your first live game at fratton park on a tuesday evening with the floodlights and the bell and the pompey chimes and then you go all the way through to the cup final, then you go into Europe. I mean, wow, what what a fantastic journey. And these are all, every single one of these I've done is always a fantastic journey because people have little bits that they remember and it comes out. And we've mm. even got Shaka Khan in the middle, which uh, <laughs> I don't, as I say, I haven't had anyone else mention Shaka Khan in their memories. One final question is... Well, it's a two-part question. Have you ever taken anyone to their first game? So a uh, partner or niece or... I mean, I know you've got triplets, but they're a bit young to be going to games. They are very young. What what age do you think they could be going to their first game? Yeah, so I mean, you're going to have to yeah. buy a lot of tickets for a start. If you've got I am. Yeah, yeah, I am. So they're 10, they're 10 months old now. Tickets so yeah. we'll, we'll see what... Um, we'll see what route the three of them go down. So I've got identical girls and a boy. 
Right. Um, so obviously, my my ambition is for all three of them to be to be great football fans, and for me to be taking them to games and to training, so they're playing and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. My partner's um, very creative and into art, so her her okay. dream is that they all you know they all draw and they all they all paint. So we'll see how that plays out. So I'll take hmm. I'll take at least one of them I, if you okay. know if I can get one of the three of them to to be a football fan I'll I'll take that but it's not it's not going to be for a few years yet I don't think no but I, I, would I, agree I with can that. honestly say I I am I am it's one of the things I think that I'm looking forward to most about being mm. a dad is hopefully yeah. taking one two and hopefully three all of them to a to their first game because it's yeah. magical isn't it it's a magical yeah. experience you're passing on the baton and it's, it's exactly you know i've done it with my son and you know my daughters have been as well although they weren't paying as much attention as my son was <laughs> um have you taken your partner to has she gone to a pompey game she has she hasn't i mean i have to be honest she would have very little interest in in going okay. to a going to a game which yeah. is which is good and i love yeah. her for it yeah. Fine. she's into her art you're into your football never the twain shall meet it's fine maybe <laughs> they could all do your triplets become football artists and that would you know that then would combine the two thing no. great for my retirement if they if they could perfect <laughs> um so just one last question on a first front is what was your first commentary game for match of the day oh Oh, I'm throwing that at you. You, you are. I didn't think you were going to ask me that. Um, well, that I always said, like to throw in a sidewinder at the you've, end. You've though. got, yeah, you've, you've, you've got me there. Um, I know, I know where, I know where, I know who, who was at home. I cannot tell you who the away team was though, which is slightly awkward for me. So I'll have to go and look that up because the first, I can tell yeah. you, it was Swansea. I know that okay. it was Swansea, but I don't know who what year would that have been then that was about 2017 something like that 20 maybe 2018 but i'll have to hope it wasn't that palace game when they beat us 5-4 no but i was there for that game were you really not for match of the day i was there for final score but i was there oh my god Uh, and it is still yeah it's still now as you can imagine the crate probably Probably is the craziest football game that I've had the pleasure of witnessing. I think, so. well, pleasure. I would, I would, I would temper that with the fact that we were <laughs> we were four three up, yeah. you know, three minutes into added time, having taken the lead and been three to. Yeah, anyway, let's let's not dwell on that. But um, yeah, well, you'll you'll have to let us know what that um, first match of the day was. But I um, will. I can tell you my Swansea. first. I can tell you my first commentary game, my first radio commentary game with the doing local then, radio. That, yeah. So I do remember that. And so obviously that was with Portsmouth. It was at Craven Cottage against Fulham. It mm-hmm. finished 1-1 and it will always stick in my mind, not because the game, because the game was the game was pretty, pretty average, really. Nico Cranchar scored for Pompey. Right. And then with the very last kick of the game, Fulham equalised through Ian Pierce. Now, Ian Pierce, the old sort mm. of brutish centre half, was yeah. with West Ham, I think, for a Blackburn while. Blackburn as, well. as well, wasn't he? I think. That's right. Yeah. 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 And yeah. he he had got injured in the game and Fulham had run out of substitutes. So he was, he was hobbling around. And I mean this on, on one leg and he's hit this ball from the edge of the area and it's taken a deflection. It's gone in and it's one, one and Fulham got a point. And within the commentary, obviously it was my very first game that I did at Craven cottage, where we were sat, you had the supporters right in front of you. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, I imagine within the game, being quite young and naive, I'd maybe got a little carried away with my commentary, a little excited, maybe when Nico Cranchar scored. And yeah. it's fair to say there was a there was a section of about three or four Fulham fans in front of me who mm. were not happy. Right when Ian Pearce equalised, oh, they yeah <laughs> they turned around in in my face because they were in my face because they were literally mm. in the row in front of me. Um, and I mean, you can imagine what was what was going on. The, yeah. the words and the signals were all yes. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, while I'm trying to commentate on the game as well, uh, the match finishes, and I was with Alan McLaughlin, who I talked about mm-hmm. earlier, um, and he was always quite protective of me anyway. And the full time whistle went, and there was a, sh- <laughs> a steward was having to hold a- Alan back from right, trying okay. to get to these fans to to yeah. let them know that what they'd done was unacceptable i think to put it to put it 
politely okay. um, so that was a very memorable first commentary for me of course yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, the couple of times afterwards I went to Fulham and I was always a little fearful that something would happen again but I can honestly say now I mean obviously a city you're, you're still within that media box when you're doing the radio at least yeah surrounded quite by fans, tight but they've mm-hmm. been nothing they've been nothing but pleasant Fulham fans since then so it must have just been one of those days yeah well I, I you know Fulham fans are generally quite benign I think they're not uh, particularly vitriolic, but you managed to wind them up when I did. Uh, I did on, on your first reporting commentary. <laughs> so great place to finish, I think, Chris. But been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, I particularly enjoyed the stuff about Alan Knight and the fact now you you still see him regularly down at Fratton Park. And I think possibly my favourite bit is the fact that Guy Whittingham was known as Corporal Punishment. That that is going to live with him now. But it's been a pleasure having you on. It started with a kick. Um, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.